there are two components to the coronary vasculature, the arteries which feed the heart, the myocardium, and they are the first branches of the aorta, and then the veins which receive the blood back and drain mostly to the coronary sinus, although, as I'll also discuss, some come directly back to the right atrium. If we look first of all at the coronary arteries, I've closed in here on the aortic root, and what you can clearly now see is that the right and left coronary arteries are the first branches of the aorta. So here, arising superiorly and to the left, we have the left coronary artery, and that permits us to name the sinus of the aorta adjacent to the pulmonary trunk as the left coronary sinus. Inferiorly and to the right, the right coronary artery, permitting us to name this second of the aortic sinuses that is adjacent to the subpulmonary infundibulum as the right coronary sinus, and then, obviously, the third sinus, inferiorly and posteriorly, is the non-coronary aortic sinus. And it is as rare as hen's teeth to find coronary arteries arising from this non-adjacent aortic sinus. And in my entire career, I've only, only, only ever seen one heart in which a coronary artery is from this particular sinus. So we see the origin of the coronary arteries very beautifully if we position the heart in its attitudinally appropriate uh, situation and we cut away the subpulmonary infundibulum. So here is an anatomic Ross procedure. We've taken away the pulmonary trunk. We've taken away its supporting subpulmonary infundibulum. And now we see the right coronary artery arising inferiorly and immediately entering the right atrioventricular groove, and the left coronary artery arising superiorly, pointing out the obliquity of the aortic root. And in fact, the aortic root is positioned at right angles relative to the pulmonary root, so the two show marked obliquity relative to each other. And now we see the coronary arteries themselves, because of course, although there are two coronary arteries arising from the aortic root. We name three coronary arteries for the description of coronary arterial disease, so-called three-vessel disease, and these coronaries are the right coronary, the anterior interventricular artery, and then subsequently we will see the circumflex artery. But here, looking at it from the front, we can see the branches of the anterior interventricular artery, so, taking off and moving as we look here towards our right hand, towards the morphologically left ventricle, we see the diagonal branches of the anterior interventricular artery. And here, moving towards our left hand, towards the plane between the right ventricle and the left ventricle, we have the septal perforating arteries. And this particular heart, the predominant artery feeding the septum, is the first septal perforating branch. You can also see here at the base of the picture another important point, so-called myocardial bridging, and there is some degree of myocardial bridging over the coronary arteries, probably in two-thirds of all normal hearts. So if we first look at the course of the right coronary artery, having entered the right atrioventricular groove, it encircles the orifice of the tricuspid valve as you see in this picture of the heart where we've taken away the right atrium so that you can see the right atrioventricular junction from above and from the right. And another crucially important artery is seen here arising from the right coronary artery. This is the situation in 55% of the population where the first atrial branch of the right coronary artery is the artery which runs to irrigate the sinus node. The other important branches of the right coronary artery are then the acute marginal branch, which takes off at the acute margin. And then, here, in this particular specimen, we see the major artery running down to supply the diaphragmatic surface of the heart, the so-called posterior interventricular branch, which in reality is inferior and interventricular. And then, as is in the situation in the majority of the population, 
the right coronary artery itself continues beyond the site of the interventricular septum, the part we call the crooks of the heart, a word we have not used yet, but which will, we will use several times in future. So in the majority of the population, the right coronary artery continues beyond the crooks to the diaphragmatic surface of the left ventricle. The circumflex artery then is another of the branches of the main stem of the left coronary artery. We've already looked at the anterior interventricular artery and its diagonal branches, its septal perforating branches. Here we're concentrating on the circumflex artery, which, when the left main stem branches, enters the left atrioventricular groove between the left atrial appendage and the obtuse marginal branch of the left ventricle. And here is one of the arteries from the circumflex, which is running towards the ventricular mass and irrigating that obtuse marginal artery. Nowadays, with resonance imaging and with computerized tomography, the delineation of these coronary arteries is quite exquisite. And here is another of Andrew Taylor's exquisite pictures, which show you how everything that we now show you in the autopsy room, you can see even better during life. So without question, tomorrow's cardiac anatomists are going to be the echocardiographers and the imagers who can now produce these quite exquisite views showing us left coronary artery, anterior interventricular, circumflex branch, right coronary artery, encircling the tricuspid valvar orifice and moving round the right atrioventricular junction to the crooks of the heart where it gives rise to the inferior interventricular branch. That is the situation in nine-tenths of the population where it is the right coronary artery which irrigates the crooks of the heart. In the other 10% of the population, however, it is the circumflex artery which feeds the inferior interventricular branch. And here you see such an example of left coronary arterial dominance where the circumflex artery runs in much greater proximity to the annulus of the mitral valve gives rise now to the arteries which irrigate the diaphragmatic surface of the left ventricle, and then in left coronary arterial dominance, it is the circumflex that is giving rise to the inferior interventricular artery and continuing on to supply the diaphragmatic surface to the right ventricle. So rapidly summarizing the arrangement of the coronary veins, the coronary veins parallel the arterial supply they receive the blood from the ventricular myocardium and for the larger part they deposit the myocardial venous return into the coronary sinus. The coronary sinus occupies the left atrioventricular junction and the coronary sinus begins at the point where the oblique vein of the left atrium, the vein of Marshall, joins the great vein that has run up the anterior interventricular groove along with the anterior interventricular artery. And usually at this point of union between the oblique vein and the great vein, there is also a valvar structure that is called the valve of Yersens. The second important coronary vein is the one that runs along with the inferior interventricular artery, and that is appropriately named as the middle cardiac vein because it occupies the middle part of the diaphragmatic surface of the ventricular mass. And then the third important vein running along with the right coronary artery is the small cardiac vein, which opens into the coronary sinus just before the coronary sinus itself forms its with the morphologically right atrium. So the larger part of the coronary veins drain to the coronary sinus, through the great vein, the middle vein, a small vein. There are, however, then a further series of veins, and these veins drain directly into the atrial chambers. That can happen even more extensively in congenitally malformed hearts, as we'll show when we come to discuss isomerism of the atrial appendages. But here in this anterior view of a normal heart, very nicely you see in this situation the anterior cardiac vein, quite a substantial structure, 
opening directly into the right atrium. And in all hearts, there are then the smaller cardiac veins, in veins, which dire drain directly to the atrial cavities. Now, we also need to consider the conduction tissues, but unlike everything else that we've shown you thus far, we cannot demonstrate directly the location of the conduction tissues, so we have to establish the landmarks that permit you to predict where it is likely to be that you will find conduction tissue. Because, of course, it is the conduction tissue that drives the electrical activity within the heart. And so the conduction tissues start at the sinus node. The sinus node delivers the impulse that activates the ventroatrial myocardium. And it is the activation of the atrial myocardium itself that gives us the P wave of the electrocardiogram. The atrioventricular node, the second crucial part of the conduction tissue, then delays the cardiac impulse so that the atrial chambers can contract so as to force the blood across the atrioventricular junctions. And it is this delay within the atrioventricular node that gives us our PR interval. Having delayed the impulse sufficiently for the atrial chambers to fill the ventricles, the Cardiac impulse is then disseminated rapidly through the ventricular bundle branches and their terminal ramifications, the so-called Purkinje fibers. And then activation of the ventricular myocardium gives us the QRS complex, with, of course, the atrial myocardium being separated from the ventricular myocardium all the way around the atrioventricular junctions, other than at the point of penetration of the atrioventricular conduction axis, which is, of course, the bundle of Hiss. This atrioventricular conduction axis was exquisitely demonstrated in 1906. So next year, we will be celebrating the centenary of this truly epochal demonstration by Sonal Tawara, a Japanese worker who worked in the lab of Ashoff, and this is a picture taken from Tawara's book that we've reorientated to become attitudinally appropriate. And you see that Tawara has shown atrial myocardium in yellow. He's then shown these components of the atrioventricular conduction axis in orange, the conotin, the atrioventricular node, insulating tissue separating atrial myocardium from ventricular myocardium shown in purple, and the only structure that passes across this insulating tissue is the bundle of Hiss, which in fact had been described 10 years previously or 13 years previously, but nobody really understood the arrangement of the bundle of Hiss until Tawara produced this exquisite picture showing us how the bundle of Hiss branches into left bundle branch, right bundle branch, astride the interventricular septum, the key point being that the bundle branches are insulated by sheaths of fibrous tissue from the ventricular myocardium. And so we can recognize these branches of the atrioventricular conduction axis as could Tawara from their histologic arrangement. So here in a section of ventricular septum, we see this insulated strand of myocardium, which is histologically distinct, traceable from section to section. And it is these features which permit us to recognize this as being conduction tissue. And it is the fact that it is insulated from the myocardium that tells us that it is an electrically active tract that conducts from the remainder of the ventricular myocardium. When we look at the nodes, however, and here we see a section across the terminal crest, with here the musculature of the terminal crest, here the musculature of the superior cable vein, we can see that this tissue set around a nodal artery is also histologically distinct, can be traced from section to section, but unlike the ventricular conduction pathways, it is not insulated from atrial myocardium. So the nodes satisfy only two of these three criteria that we have for the conduction system. Nodes are histologically discrete and can be traced when we look at microscopic serial sections, whereas the conduction axis itself 
the crucial pathway, which is the only way that the impulse gets from the atriums to the ventricles, is not only discrete and followed from section to section, but insulated from fibrous tissue. Using those rules, we can locate the sinus node as between the appendage and the superior cable vein lying within the terminal groove, so that if we cut a section inferior to the crest of the atrial appendage, then we see the picture, as I've just shown you, with sandwich between the musculature of the superior cable vein and the terminal crest, set around its prominent artery, we find the sinus node. The internodal atrial myocardium, however, is no more than ordinary atrial tissue. And these so-called internodal tracts are figments of people's imagination. There is no way that the internodal myocardium is discrete as is the sinus node and as is the atrioventricular node. Instead, this is ordinary atrial myocardium, quite discrete from the atrioventricular conduction axis. The atrioventricular conduction axis is the key point to be recognized in the operating room, also in the catheter laboratory. And so the landmarks we use are the valvar structures I've already introduced you to, the eustachian valve guarding the inferior cable vein, the, which continues as the tendon of Totoro, which passes between the oval fossa to re and the coronary sinus to reach the central fibrous body, a second crucial border, the hinge point of the tricuspid valve, these two together forming two of the boundaries of the triangle of Koch. And it is at the apex of the triangle of Koch, the base of which is formed by the coronary sinus, that we find the atrioventricular node. Another crucial landmark is this so-called septal isthmus, a further one, the inferior isthmus, this is the location of the slow pathway. This is the crucial isthmus for atrial fibrillation. Having penetrated from the apex of the triangle of cock, the conduction tissue ramifies on the crest of the ventricular septum. And here again, going back to Toara's beautiful monograph, we see the location of the left bundle branch, which streams down the smooth aspect of the ventricular septum. So for us as anatomists, the landmarks to the course of the atrioventricular conduction axis are the tendon of Totoro, the hinge of the tricuspid valve, which demarcate the apex of the triangle of cock. It is there we find the atrioventricular node. The conduction axis penetrates to the left, where it gives rise to the left bundle branch. It then comes back through the septum and emerges on the right side at the medial papillary muscle. So if we join the two, the apex of the triangle of cock to the medial papillary muscle, we find the location of the atrioventricular node. 